We're live. Hey guys, welcome back. It's the Dr. Cloud Show. And um, we are, for those of you who are new, we're rebooting the show that we started in COVID and did every day in COVID. We're trying to get back to a normal cadence. We don't know exactly what that's going to be. We're going to be kind of um, playing around with the format, having some exciting changes coming up, not too distant future in those. But we thought, you know, why let the perfect be the enemy of the good? It's better to come on and do a little bit here and there or more than here and there if we can. So we're here. Um, this is a call-in program. That means that you can call in and I get to talk to you finally. So call me. Here's the number, 844-940-2774. That's 844-940-2774. To get on the air and um, like the birds used to sing, remember that song? If you want to be a rock and roll star, then, well, if you want to be a um, talk show star, then 844-940-2774 to get on the program. Um, so here's the deal. What we do here is while calls are coming in at what number? Oh, yeah. 844-940-2774. Um, I talked for a few minutes about, you know, kind of things I've been looking at and writing about, researching um, coming across my work or my own life and have us think about stuff because, you know, if you just live your life, you're not um, probably doing anything but living the way that you're already wired. And we know the goal in life is to rewire everything so it has an upward trend, right? And also to stop some of that bad stuff. So that's what we do. We talk about... Um, some ways to do that each and every show, and then obviously in the callers. But today, what I wanted to talk about, and we'll get into that in just a second, is how your day-to-day -day life can heal you. You know, usually we look at healing as I'm going to do my life, and then I go over here and sit in my shrink's office and lie on the couch or, you know, have my eyes go back and forth or whatever you do in your healing life and your support group or recovery or whatever. But I remember... <clears throat> um, I had a uh, professor one time tell me, you know, you can't heal life an hour a week on a shrink's couch. It takes more than that. Well, that's what we're going to talk about. But before we do that, um, remember, we have a holiday sale going on on the platform of Boundaries.me. If you do not know about Boundaries.me or you don't know if you're a member, some people get our emails every day and, you know, little clips here and there. And they think, oh, yeah, I'm on Boundaries. Well, you're not unless you're a subscriber where you get all of the big stuff. And that's over a hundred courses um, on all the topics we talk about, about life relationships, you know, struggles, tips on how to handle difficult people, reaching goals, all that stuff. And there's over a hundred courses on there. There's also with the boundaries.me plus membership, you get access to all of the webinars that we do throughout the year. We do one about every six weeks or so, and you get the archive of all the past topics. There's over 20 long form webinars on there. So if you are a student of your life or a student of psychology and faith and all that stuff, um, it's a pretty robust platform. Think Netflix where you have all the genres of different movies. Well, this is, your own growth platform where I've filmed more than a hundred courses in different genres of life to help you grow. Go to boundaries.me forward slash plus to take advantage of the holiday sale where the whole thing is under half price as the holidays go on. Um, you'll get all that stuff and also a structured path that'll help you heal and grow and a daily coaching email, video, short form, a tip every day for you to do to help you grow will come into your inbox if you are a subscriber. Boundaries.me forward slash plus. All righty. So how in the world is your day-to-day -day life going to heal you? Well, let's talk about that. As I said, a lot of times we think of healing and growth as being something we kind of segment to a you know, some portion of time and focus every week. Like you go to a recovery group or you go see your therapist or you're in a support group or you read something or, 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 or. Well, <clears throat> as a competitive golfer my whole life, 
I watch videos um, of great golf swings. I read instructional stuff on the game of golf and how to play it well. Whatever your field is, you can apply this. You know, we learn stuff, right? Or we have a time to work on it. But we can learn all this stuff, but then you got to go play around. You can go to the practice range, but then you got to get on the course, right? And you have to do it. And it's in the doing it that all the stuff we're reading about and learning actually begins to form and structure who you are. And I don't know if you notice this or not, but all the dysfunctional patterns with difficult people or in struggles that you have in the way you interact or reaching goals or performing or whatever that is you're doing, working on in therapy. Well, those patterns are used and play out as you go through your life day to day. So what we've got to be doing is we've got to be on a dual track as you go through your days with your spouse or girlfriend or boyfriend or extended family or coworker or whoever it is that you're doing life with at different points and contexts. And we've actually got to be aware of those issues that you talk about in therapy or you read about in a book or you watch on a video. And then as you go live out those moments, your day-to-day -day life can heal you as you're doing a couple of things, as you become aware, okay, this is one of those situations where I'm kind of feeling a little bit controlled here. I've been learning in therapy that I learned to be that way in a certain context, and that developed all of this pain that I talked to my therapist about, but also developed patterns of how I let people control me. And this is one of those situations. It's happening now. And so when you have that awareness inside, and generally your feelings will, or your cognitions, will be <laughs> a pretty good dashboard. Like on your car when you're driving, there's a little red light blinking or a speedometer or whatever. It tells you that your feelings are that this is happening right now. Now is what we talked about in therapy. Now it's when I've got to take that feeling, turn it into words, and take the appropriate action about that issue. So let me give you a couple of areas. Um, by the way, I'll give the number out again. 844-940-2774 is the number to call. 844-940-2774. And if you have a fear of calling into a live radio broadcast or podcast or whatever we call this, you have a fear of that. This is real life. So now... You can actually practice that as we're talking about. You can dial that number, 844-940-2774. So as you're going through life, these moments come up. What I want to do is I want to give you just a few of many, many kind of uh, like bellwether, you know, watershed, big life-forming patterns that tend to lead to things like depression, anxiety, addictions, relationship problems, all that kind of stuff. That if you would be aware of these patterns day to day, when you're in these situations and begin to, number one, be aware of them, notice that you're doing it in real time or having the invitation to do it, the temptation to do it, and then deliberately practicing something new in the moment that's how we grow. Now, there's a reason for that. When you do it, new neurological wiring circuitry is being formed as you do things. You know, you've all heard about habit formation and all that and how long it takes. And a lot of that stuff is, um, all of that is, is a true concept, but generally it takes longer than you. It takes 23 days to change it. There's so much involved in that. But what is not at question is that it takes the doing to do it, okay? You probably never think about before you go to bed brushing your teeth. Well, when you were a kid, you didn't think about that. Somebody had to make you aware of it. That's the video, mom on your case about it. But then you had to pick up the brush and you had to do it and you did it over and over and over again. And then you were not 
a person who didn't brush their teeth, you became a person who brushes their teeth. And you don't do it as a big burden every day and have to read a manual on it. You have changed. One of the things when I went in the field of psychology that troubled me was a lot of stuff out there was talking about coping. And we learned new coping mechanisms, which are very important as you're going through the process of dealing with anything. But I kind of decided I wasn't going to go into the field if that's all there was. But I felt pretty strong leading by, from God to continue down this field and learning more and more and more. And then I began to learn, no, you know, it's not, it's not always somebody's, they got an eating disorder, so they've got to learn to cope with that for the rest of their life. Or they are depressed, so they got to manage their depression or anxiety for the rest of their life. Now, certainly there's time involved, but I began to see people who were depressed become people who no longer got depressed or who had anxiety or ruminations or fears who turned into a person that didn't have that anymore. Now, again, it's not so all or nothing that you flip a switch. But over time, doing the right things, that actually that kind of transformation actually is possible. Now, depending on obviously how deep and how early and how broken and all that, the time thing changes. But the good news here is that new patterns can be developed. And you all the time hear about stories of, you know, somebody they're in a horrible abusive marriage and they got out of that and they went through you know, divorce recovery, and they changed and they learned patterns and new ways of being in a relationship and, and new ways of who to be attracted to and not be attracted to. And they actually started liking broccoli. <laughs> when you were a kid, you, you didn't really like vegetables. You only wanted ice cream. Well, that's a bad relationship a lot of times. The thing that feels good immediately gives you cavities, root canals, and, you know, gain a bunch of weight. And then somebody had to train you to actually eat foods you didn't like. And then you began to, oh, I, I think I do like that. And then it became kind of normal. Well, your appetites for life change as you grow and new patterns begin to develop. And here's the deal. Please hear this. When new patterns develop, then those patterns become a different you that develops and a different you that develops leads a different life one that is healing and even healed in a lot of different areas. But we have to do that in real time, okay? We can't just go talk about it and read about it. We got to do it. Got to do it. So what are a few of those things? Let me give the number again, 844-940-2774. Um, even if you don't have a problem, you want to ask about a, issue or a topic you want to learn more about, call me, 844-940-2774 is the number. Okay, so what are a few of these things? Well, <clears throat> number one, a lot of people get into dysfunctional patterns in life because they're, when their patterns are formed, they're, they're formed in relationship with difficult people, usually Originally, you know, families of origin, parents, significant figures, even later in life, some relationships you have to recover from. And one of those patterns is this, that that person is so difficult in some way that you develop a vigilance of focusing only on the other person and what you think they want or need from you or what you have to do to make them... Uh, calm down, to make them like you, to make them approve of you, all of that. And the big focus here is, I don't know why I've got that bubble. Do y'all see a bubble? Have I, hey, Greg, uh, can you guys hear me? Have I stalled out here? Yeah, I'm Have seeing I, it too, Henry. I'm going to look into it right now. All right, let's do that. Um, we're still, I'm sure, um, I think everybody can still hear us, right? Can That's everybody still hear us? That is can. correct. Okay. Um, so we are... Uh, Remove spotlight. I don't know what that means. Where did we go here? Um, ah, sorry, we have a little techno problem here. Um, yeah, just restart your video, Henry. Okay, we will do that. We'll restart the video. Let's see if that works. Okay, I'm back. Um, so what I was saying was you um, 
you get into going through life with a focus only on the other person. And then their behavior triggers your pattern of how you learn to respond to somebody who's maybe angry or somebody who's disapproving or somebody who might not like what you're thinking. Okay, so I want you to do something new. I want you to, in those situations, certainly part of emotional intelligence is we have to be aware of ourselves and others, right? So you certainly want to be aware of the other people. I mean, that's basic mirror neurons and starting at infancy. We have to be able to read tone and expressions and all that of the other person. But they're not the only one in the in the moment. You're there too. So you can learn to see what's going on with them and then also be aware, what am I feeling about that? Do I like that? Do I want to do what they're saying or not? Do I want to somehow negate me and what I'm feeling or wanting or not liking and instantly go into that old pattern of giving them what I think they want or like or need? And I want you to turn this into what is called a relationship, not where you're an object just serving them, okay? So then you become aware of your own feelings. And then you have choices. You don't have to react in the same way the pattern tells you to react. You don't have to automatically give in to them or do what they want. You can tune into your own feelings and say, you know what, I don't like this. And then you can let your feelings and awarenesses and your judgments inside teach you or tell you in the moment what you want to do. You know what? Um, yeah, I hear what you're saying, but that's not really what I want to do. Um, I think I'd like to do something different. I have a different perspective on that. Or if they're getting angry or whatever, we're saying, see, this is upsetting to you. Um, I'm sorry, it's frustrating, you know, when I say no, but um, I'm going to have to stick to that. Hope you don't, you know, hope that it isn't too hard for you or whatever it is. You have choices, but you don't have choices until you become aware of yourself in the moment, not just the pattern of whatever. Let me give you another one. How about in the moment starting to when it is good, safe, wise and helpful to be honest about your vulnerability. So how are you doing today? Oh, great. Yeah, I'm fine. You know, things are good. When you know they're not. And this is really somebody who would be caring. Why don't you say, well, you know, honestly, it's kind of a tough time right now. And if you're with somebody that is deserving of knowing you better, then they're going to say, oh, really? Tell me why a new step, a different pattern for you in that moment will be to say, well, honestly, I've, um, I've gone through some losses lately or I'm struggling with my job. You know, I just read a fascinating article um, and it, I think it was in the Wall Street Journal, but I'm not sure about how the holidays are one of the most difficult times for people about one question because they get in family gatherings or parties and they get asked about their work and their work's not going well. They can't find a job or they're, they're kind of feel stuck in a job that they don't like and everybody else is succeeding and all this. And they actually don't go to gatherings because they're afraid of that question. Well, maybe that's a pattern of feeling like you have to meet other people's expectations or this and the other. And maybe the truth is, um, no, you don't. Why can't you say, um, you know what, I'm finding it kind of tough out there right now. I've been wanting to change jobs. I'm sending out a bunch of resumes, going on interviews, and I really haven't found it yet. You know, I was talking to a friend of mine um, who uh, is um, a very, very, very accomplished Hollywood executive. And through some, you know, uh, takeovers and some other stuff, he he, in his 50s, um, things got reorganized and his role got taken away. And we're all sitting around, um, you know, in a social gathering and and somebody asked me, he said, said, man, it's brutal. And I said, what? And he said, 
you know, just talked about kind of that landscape. And it was so cool. Everybody kind of leaned in. And I think he experienced some care from some people, which is a good thing. And probably that's going to lead to some people, you know, sending him some maybe connections that he wouldn't have had just from the vulnerability with good people. But how tempting it is to say, oh, it's great. You know, I'm going through a I'm going through some changes, looking for some new opportunity and acting all happy about it when he wasn't. I feel a lot closer to him just because he was vulnerable. Now, there'd be some idiots that you probably don't want to do that with, but that's where when you're aware, you begin to have choices. What about the simple thing of saying no if you tend to be a yes person? Or what about um, the tendency to, to think, that you're around perfectionists and they're not going to like any kind of mistake or any kind of failure, you know? So what? You're not living your life for them. Well, if you say, yeah, <laughs> I just really blew it. Or I just really had a whatever. I mean, all of these things Or what about your own power? And I don't mean power in dominating people. I mean, power in what it truly is, which is expertise. Sometimes people are afraid to say, um, you know, what you're really saying, I don't think that's true because I do know some stuff about this and and just disagreeing, just good old fashioned disagreeing. How about stuff like that? But see, when you're doing these and you're taking these steps in your day to day moments, you are are literally diminishing the power of old biological, neurological, psychological, emotional, spiritual, and all sorts of other patterns living in the hardware, <clears throat> those are kind of laying down as new ones come up, and those are the ones you feed, and then it changes. It's called neuroplasticity. It's how we grow. I'll never forget one time, and we're going to go to calls in just a second, but I'll never forget one time, um, <laughs> I was, we had, um, we had just moved in, into our house and it's a hundred and about a hundred year old house. And so we get a new phone line put in. So we go down in the basement and the phone guy's there and he says, where, you know, where's the phone? Stuff? So I took him down in the basement and oh my gosh, it looked like, like beehives of spider webs of wiring. How many phone wires there were from a hundred years in that house. And I go, oh my gosh, how do you find the right one? He goes, what do you mean? I said, well, you're hooking up a new, which one's the one that's hot? And he goes, oh, I'm not going to deal with, with all of that. I'm just going to string a new one in here. We're going to ignore all of that. I go, man, you ought to be a psychologist because that's exactly what people have to do is stop using the old wiring and lay down a new one. I said, well, what's, don't you have to take all that stuff out? He goes, no, it's just, it's just it, 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 the system will just ignore it. It's just dead. Well, that's what your brain really does. I mean, memories don't necessarily go away. They just lose their power of these systems and these patterns as we don't hook them up to daily use. Besides, think if you use those old wires, what the static would be like from a 1920-something wire on a phone. Well, yeah, well, let's just look at some of our interactions. There's a lot of static that goes on. So that's it. I want you to use today in your day-to-day -day life to change. All right. Um, <clears throat> let's go on to our phones. We have a great call from Lauren, who's calling us from South Carolina. And she wants to know, how do I grieve a friendship that's over? I feel like she's moved on and I'm still ruminating. What am I missing to get past this? Lauren, welcome to the program. Well, I think. Sorry about that, Henry. The, the caller again? Lauren? Lauren from South Carolina. Here she is. Can you hear me? Hey there. Hello. Welcome to the show. Can you hear me? Can I, I can. I thought I was the friend that now you blew off. I couldn't hear you. 
<laughs> no, no, here I am. I know. I'm like, maybe it's me. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe the other friend is calling, you know, Dr. Phil or somebody and saying, Lauren won't talk to me anymore. Okay. So tell yeah. me, what, tell me the briefly the situation. Can't go into the whole history, but what's going on? What's the question? Yeah, definitely. Um, so we were both living in the same city. Um, this was somebody who, again, was really a really safe, really close friend to me, someone who I thought was going to be like in my life in a really significant way um, forever. Was this an adult, an adult friend? You made an adulthood or childhood? Yeah, this was adulthood. So we were both probably in our mid 20s. So, um, and so we were both living in the same city. A couple years ago, we both moved away, and I guess I had kind of assumed that we would still stay really close, um, but that just hasn't been the case. Uh, her life changed a lot. She met her future husband, found an amazing new community, is starting a family, and I did not, <laughs> so I'm still trying to find those things, um, but I think just I haven't been able to like fully grieve through this friendship because I um, what, like my mind can see like okay she's kind of moved on it doesn't seem like she wants the same closeness like her uh, life is really long, thriving how long has it been since she moved like two years so two i would years really in. like to get and after yeah. she moved were you guys in contact for a while and it then diminished or it just kind of went ghost uh no it wasn't it was in contact um and I, I think what I was most like observing is it's like but no real like phone calls. If I, I went on a travel adventure, had something in my life going on, it wasn't like a, Hey, I want to hear all about it. Um, but she would invite me to like those big things in her life, like with, you know, going to the wedding and things like that. But I just felt like um, there wasn't really that back and forth interest in the things that are going on in my life. So I don't have like hate <laughs> you know, towards her, like, I can understand that there's a lot of amazing, beautiful things in this new pathway of her life, but I, I'm just, like, it hurts knowing that I wanted something more from the friendship that I don't think she is really wants to give, and how to, like, just accept that and Okay, so, so if I get this <laughs> for clarity, <clears throat> um, you're still talking to her, she just doesn't seem interested in you, or you're not talking to her. Yeah, we're, we will like talk very like almost more surface levelly. Like not like I don't get the instance like that she would give me a call and say, "Hey, just saw you on this great trip. Like I'd love to hear how you're doing, you know, yeah. or, or hey, I'd love to come out and visit and, you." And when she um, moved, is that when she got married? When she moved? Uh, no, that was before she moved first. I'm sorry, which was before? She moved first, she said? Yeah. Okay. So she moved two years ago, and then she fell in love, got married, and started a family? Yeah. Okay. Um, has this been addressed? I have tried to bring it up in ways of like, hey, I'm not feeling as close to you anymore. Um, oh. And I've brought it up occasion too and that's kind of where i'm kind of getting like i when, just don't you, think she has when you brought it up when you brought it up say you know what i don't feel as close to you anymore um it seems like the tenor of our relationship has changed a little bit and i'm missing you what did she say to that um just kind of like that and she was she was so kind and like you know didn't want me to feel that way but I was just kind of sharing how like she has a lot going on in life. And so that's, yes, yeah, so I don't, I don't hate that, <laughs> hate her for that. Um, but I think it's well, just realizing just, like, if yeah, she you, can give. Just... <laughs> and well, I think I want more <laughs> with yeah. someone who's not really willing or have the capacity to give more in a friendship. So I think I need to move on, but it's hard because I know what we were in terms of friends, but now yeah. it's hard to like. Well, is that the only now. conversation? Is that the only conversation you've had about it? Um, I think I've had 
Uh, yeah, I guess directly, yeah. Okay. You know, I'm kind of reticent a little bit just to write it off if it was that significant to you for a couple of reasons. One is um, it's not unusual at all when two single people who are very close um, that, you know, that your friendships, your close friendships when you're single are kind of your primary attachments in life. That's the way it ought to be, right? They're your kind of, you know, adult, spiritual, emotional family. And then <clears throat> one of those gets married, and especially if they have a kid, um, that does shift. I mean, that's a real shift in that now she has a primary relationship that's different than the primary relationship or relationships she used to have. That's a good thing. Now, when you have mm -hmm. a shift like that, um, actually it kind of it kind of mirrors a developmental shift shift early in life. You know, you you have a dyad with you know a caretaker or a mother. It's really just the two of you, the whole world. And then gradually, you know, the kid becomes more mobile and goes and there's a dad and brothers and sisters. And, and so, and then they kind of, you know, there's a moving away before there's a reconnecting. That's how this happens. So yeah. it could, it could kind of be that. I mean, she's investing or the old psychoanalytic term is um, it's a libidinal, a connecting investment we call it cathexis. She's attaching, taking that part of herself and reinvesting it, right? And so that's kind of gets stable. And then you kind of see a moving back. That's pretty normal that they would kind of replace you as primary. So because of that, and A, because she said, no, just, you know, this, that, and the other, it just may be that kind of normal thing. And you got a couple of options. One is you could continue to just kind of, you know, contact her and talk and just take kind of what it is and see if that changes over a little time. Or you could recognize um, that she really has moved on and you guys aren't close friends anymore. Um, but I would hate to do that without one more talking about it. And I think it would sound something like this. Um, you know, I brought this up before and I, I totally get it. I just want to, I just want to make sure um because I was really invested in our relationship and you're kind of one of my primary, you know, connections and support in life. Um, and understand if that's not true for you anymore. Um, and we still want to want to be friends, but it's kind of like, I need to reinvest somewhere. I need, I need what we had and I miss it with you. And I don't want to be, <laughs> I don't want to be bugging you or a stalker or frustrating you, but I need to, I need to kind of know what to expect from our friendship. And can you just, mm -hmm. you just be honest with me? Now you could do that as well. And that directly. Um, but if you've ascertained that you think that just really is true, then a couple of things, <clears throat> I would really work hard on my own reinvestment. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I would I would name the things that I got from her that were meaningful. Like somebody that, that cared about me and what I was doing as much as I did almost, you know, and somebody that could listen and somebody that's encouraged. And just name the and then and then like when we build community to go find that. And then you're gonna mm -hmm. experience kind of old wiring does down that maybe she has after you've determined that's what it is. But I'm going to give you one more thing to do. And I, but I think that one is key. Okay. Th that one's key. Some relationships, some friendships are for life. Some some friendships have seasons. And I think we can all point to certain people we're very close to um, that <clears throat> that season passed. Things changed, you know, and they were they were they were very close friends for a season. Now it's normal that the season has passed. I can name people like that in my life. But there are other ones that truly are a lifetime. And I'd want to know which one, which one this is. And if it if it was that season of life and she's moved on, um, then I think you have to kind of normalize that and grieve it like you would grieve any anything else by talking about it. But I think you need to 
build your base in a new way first. Now, the third thing I would say is, third thing I would say is this. If she was maybe one of the first people that you've ever gotten to that depth with, then that probably means, if you'd never had that before, that there's probably some maybe, and I'm going to use a strong term here, and I hate to use this, but it says what I'm trying to say, that maybe you grew up around people that couldn't connect with you or around somebody that didn't really put you first, like a sibling or a parent. Mm -hmm. And this mm -hmm. could be hitting that button. And a lot of mm -hmm. what you're still on and ruminating about is you're reliving that symbolically through her. And that's something that a good therapist could help you with. You say, my friend moved away and she doesn't really, she's not interested in me anymore. And then a good therapist would say, well, where have you ever felt that in your life before? And then you would unpack that. So, that help? Yeah, you don't want to do that here in 20 minutes. <laughs> okay. What's that? But I think that's really... <laughs> what did you say? I said, oh yeah, you want to just do that right here for 20 minutes? I'm just so, so you can <laughs> see how that might be true. Is that right? Yes. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Definitely. My hunch is... Yeah, my hunch is that's part of what you're dealing with. You know, I'm going to give you one more thing mm. and we got to go some other callers. Remember mm -hmm. when you were a child, because this is true for everybody who was ever a child. Most people I know were children at one point. When you were a child, starting with your primary attachment object, usually a mother, or whoever's in place of mother. They're your whole world. Literally. Now, as time goes on, then that expands to this little group, your family. And that's kind of your world. And then there's a second tier when you start to have friends and all of that. But when you're little and these, you know, your heart's being developed and and you're abandoned by a parent or not believed in by a parent, then that's the whole world. And so sometimes later in life, some people do this when they go through a divorce or a breakup, you know, if they're dating or whatever, when that one person moves away or they lose them, it feels like I'm alone in the world. My whole world of relationship has gone away. That's not normal for an adult. The only time one person meets all of our needs is the dyad of infancy. So I would want her to be a deep friendship that you have lost in the community of other deep friendships. So it's just a little tidbit about why this may be affecting you like that. Okay. Thank you. All right, Lauren, are you a boundaries.me member? Uh, I'm not. You're that's not? Like should be. <laughs> You're not? Yeah. So like... <laughs> All right. Well, guess what? You have a new friend now. I know your friend moved away. You have a new friend now. And now you are a Boundaries.me Plus member. And we're going to put you on hold. And that's my Christmas gift to you. Okay? So oh. thank you for your call. And go on hold. And we'll let them take care of you on the other end. Okay? Um. You know, we forget sometimes how uh, these developmental formative years, you know, you're not just, everybody says, well, you, you know, that's in the past. Well, come on, when you build a house and you put a foundation in the ground, even though it's done 10 years ago and the thing is cracked, it might be in the past, but the thing is cracked, right? So when you walk on that side of the house, it, it kind of, you know, the floor creaks or whatever. Well, Foundational relationships are very, very important. Very, very important. Um, so let's go to, uh, where are we here? Um, let's talk to Erica, call us from Illinois. How do I heal from financial trauma? I self-sabotage my savings and don't know why. 
how can I take a look at my finances from a healthier perspective? Erica, welcome to the Dave Ramsey Show. No, I'm just kidding you. Um, you might you might ought to call Dave. He can probably help with this. Um, anyway, welcome to the program. Hello. Erica, are you there? Yes. I'm here now. I hear you now. <laughs> I got you. Well, it sounds like you're paying your phone bill or your internet bill. <laughs> Yeah, I wanted to give you a little bit of background on that. Um, so, okay. can, can you hear me? I, I can hear you well. Oh. Okay, it kind of goes in and out on my end. Um, so, back when I was in college, oh, I can't hear you again. I'm not saying anything. Hello? Oh, okay. Thank you. I'm sorry. Back when I was in college, um, uh, when it was time to graduate, I'm sorry, what was that? So maybe you had, didn't pay your internet bill. Anyway, go, go ahead. I'm making a joke. <laughs> <clears throat> okay. So um, when, I was, when I was graduating college and ready to go look for a car, um, I found out that um, a, a, an authority figure in my life had taken out credit cards in my name. It was like $26,000 worth of debt. And so what? I had to go... Um, yeah, I had to file bankruptcy at like 27, 20, 27 or 26 years old. And yeah, no, um, from no, from that time. No legal recourse on that? No, it was actually a family member that had asked, could they, I, I didn't know they had taken out all the things, but I didn't even know it had gotten that bad, you know, so then it turned into that. So I had to get. You knew about it and allowed it. They passed it away in, now. No. I, I knew that they asked about one credit card or two, but I had no idea it was twenty six thousand dollars. Okay, so you and right. I was just you, being trusting, and I was in college, and I was like, oh, okay. And they said they'd pay it back, so I was just like, okay. And um, at the time, it was my dad, and he's passed away now, so I'm just being very respectful of that. You know, that's why I didn't really want to go into it. But um, he was caring for a big family and all that, and. and you know, so I'm saying all that to say is that it creates a lot of like trauma from that. <laughs> it's like from there, it's like I went into I got to take care of myself. I got to, you know, and it's like and it's like I'll get jobs and I'll, they they love me or I'll do all these great things and I'll go above and beyond. And then then all of a sudden I see myself struggling in finances like there's a fear there. And then like last year, I took Dave Ramsey's class, um, uh, Dave Ramsey's FPU, Financial Peace University, and that helped me like to finally get a budget and all that. And then I ended up losing that job. And it's like, but I'll go to jobs and I'll do a great job. It's not like I, that, that, I'm usually at a job. I don't just lose it. But I didn't understand why I was at that job. And I was finally getting all my finance order and ready to pay them all off in 18 months. And then it's like, now I'm working for myself. And it's like, and then I do these great contracts with people. And then it's like, then it's like, where'd they go? How come I don't, you know, what, why don't I finish the, the job? Like why they don't work with me or like, and that doesn't happen all the time, but like, it's like this, this fear of money, like taking, being taken care of, I guess that's the fear. Like I, I'm like, man, I can't seem to take care of myself. My dad can hey, always take um, care of, like it's such fear. Hold on, Erica. I, I'm a little confused here. Um, are you saying two things? Are you saying that? Um, yes. Yeah. You tend to take care of people and try to help them out, and that gets you into financial trouble. Or are you saying that when you start that one succeeding incident at that... work, hold on, when you start succeeding at work, then you yeah. change jobs or the client doesn't work, want to work with you? We, I, I don't know which one we're dealing with. I'm sorry. All right. So thank you. So it came from first the trauma from that experience that. when I was younger with the bankruptcy. Yeah. And then now it's like when I'll be in a job, like I'll pay my bills and do all that. And either um, something happens that my money is drained again. And I don't know if I'm doing a self-sabotage to myself. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. When I wait, do that, wait, like I, wait, wait, stop, stop, stop. Something happens and then my money's drained again. That happens yeah. to a heroin addict. Okay. That happens to people who overspend <laughs> okay. and buy stuff they don't need. That happens to right. that happens to people whose relatives put pressure on them and they say yes to it. And it also happens to people whose 
have unexpected stuff like the roof caves in and life happens to them. And that's where mm -hmm. the money goes. So, so what are we talking about? Are we talking about a life, like acts of God that made your money go away? Or are we talking about relational uh, well, pain and behavioral pain? Um, thank you. Yeah. So um, last year I overcame breast cancer. So those were unexpected expenses there. Um, it's like I was like I had and I mean, I'm cancer free now, thank God. But but that produced uh, unexpected, you know, money. Um, then uh, I had like I was driving and then my tire blew out like on the expressway, just random like last month. So I ended up having to get two new tires. And it's like it's like what I had in my savings starts to get drained out or it's like I'm I do good. I work. You know, I don't go and spend any extra money. I haven't bought clothes. I don't do anything like that. It's just I'm just struggling like where I am with my money to make more money to like grow in the money. It's like the fear of the money. So it's not it's, it's like, not that I, you're I have, spending money on other people like you were doing. No. No. Okay. So what we're really talking about. Now do you have, and I'm gonna be hard on this, do you have a mm -hmm. real, a real I am living within my means, even at a lower level than I want to, and I'm <clears throat> saving my emergency fund and I'm, I'm doing, are you staying, sticking to the formula that Dave gave you in that class? Okay. So right now I've been working full time for myself. So um, there was some projects that were supposed to go through and then they waited till January. That's not, now that's, not, what, say, now, hold oh, on. that's not, that's not what I asked you. That's a, that's a separate issue. What I asked you was, okay. you went to this class and you got on the program yes. and, and you learned yes. a formula, right? You had a line-by-line yes. line budget of rice and beans if you had to. Mm -hmm. you, to get out of debt, mm -hmm. you, have a, you had an emergency account, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. You're giving some portion. So are you still yes. doing that? Did you stick to that? I am with the money that I have, yes. Okay, so you know ne you never deviated from that. It's just the savings ran out. No. Yes. I pay as soon as I have money from my clients, I, I go right on the budget and I pay it off. I pay okay. all my bills are right. paid for the month. Okay, so so, so it, it sounds like that you have an income problem, not an outgo problem. Yes. Okay. Now, I don't know a lot about your business, and we can't get into all that on a short phone call. But what I would do mm -hmm. is I would – what business are you in that you're working for yourself? <laughs> well, I have two. I'm a motivational speaker, and I also have a design business, and both bring in money for me. Okay. You mean like interior design, that kind of thing? Oh, graphic design. Website, graphic. logos. Um, okay. Yeah. So, um, what I would do immediately is I would go. What? And I don't mean this in a bad way. Okay. All of us who've ever been in business for themselves, and I—that's the only way I've ever operated. We've had mm -hmm. times where something we're trying to do isn't working, right? And mm -hmm. and here's the second part of that. We truly do have skills in that area. So there's something of value that we bring to the party that people are willing to pay for. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now that's got to be an assumption. If you're a motivational speaker, then there, for that to work, there's some people that should not be motivational speakers. Just sorry that, you know, it's like I shouldn't try to play basketball for the Lakers, right? That's never going to work. But let's just. <laughs> assume that you have this great talent and, the, and message and content and people want to pay for that. But the business side mm -hmm. of it is not working. The marketing, the getting clients, et cetera. All right. Then what you've yeah. got to do is you've got to realize that you have a business problem, a growth problem, a getting clients problem. And what you've got to do is just admit, say, you know what? I'm good at speaking. I'm just not good at getting the gigs. And when I do the gigs, they like me. 
Is that correct? Yeah, I get paid for them. I just, like you said, I just need more of them. I just That's need what more I just said, right? Business. Versus yeah. you're no yeah. good at it, right? Right, right. Okay. I'm assuming you're great at it. You just need more gigs. Or right. your design work. You know, you're really good at it. You're just not a marketer. Mm -hmm. You're not a salesperson. You're not a rainmaker. Yes. Okay. Then yes. what you've got to do, I think, what I would do, what I've done many times when I've been in that scenario and various things, is I had to admit, you know what, I, I bring some value here. But one of the things I'm not bringing is the new revenue streams or new customers or all of that. And what I learned to do early on was I need to talk to somebody who knows how to do that. And I need for them to look at my business and look at how I'm prioritizing certain activities. And there's a whole world that goes into that. And I need some coaching on how to build my business. And what I would do is I'd look around and I'd find, sounds like you can't afford a coach right now, but I would look around and I'd find somebody who does those things and sit down and tell them, look, I'm really good at this, but I'm not good at building the business and finding more opportunities. Would you have lunch with me? And would you look at what I'm doing and give me some advice? And I would look at building the business as the problem and then look at how you're going to solve that problem. Now that's A and that may work, mm -hmm. but it may be B. B may mean that's not your strength and it's never going to work. The speaking will work, the design will work, but the building a business is probably not what, maybe not what you do well. And that's where we either find a network that does that for us, okay? Or mm -hmm. you find a partner that does that for you. They get, you know, they land them, you clean them. But you've mm. got to solve this revenue problem. And the third option is if you do bring value to those things, then you go get a job where people will pay you to do that for them. That's how I would address the problem. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And I'm going to, um, sounds like the behavioral issues, you pretty much got those wired. I would stay in the financial peace thing and stick to that. Yeah. Um, I could give you reams on, you know, building a small business, but because um, there's specific ways you have to go address that. But I would suggest a book to you. Um, get Donald Miller's book, um, How to Grow Your, I, and this isn't the right title, but something about um, growing your small business or small business made simple or something like that. And I'd get another book um, called Business Made Simple by him where he takes exactly the issues that you're talking about and gives you some action steps. So big principle here for everyone. Um, I mean, anybody that's ever been in business has some aspect of this problem. It's hard to build a business. They don't just fall out of the sky. Um, and I've written about this in places, um, you know, years ago, um, <clears throat> I started a, a, um, psychiatric hospital treatment center company and we did one hospital and it was going well. Um, but then we had more than that. It should be growing and scaling. And we just kind of kept hitting this ceiling. John Townsend and I were, were building that together, kind of kept hitting the ceiling. And then we kind of randomly really. Um, came across a guy who had just retired from building um, a couple of chains of hospitals and hospital treatment centers. And we just went to dinner with him and started talking about it. And then we talked more. Well, turned out we brought value. I mean, we could help with, with marketing and media and treatment protocols and programs and content and all of that. But this guy was a machine at scaling things. And so we went to work together. And anything since then that I've ever done, I realized that the, the executing, the scaling part of it is not really what I do well. I do, I bring 
more to the doing it, whatever the, it is, if it's in media, kind of, you know, the content or if it's in treatment, all of that stuff. Or if it's in publishing, you know, there's, there's every time I write a book, I enlist an outside agency for all of the getting the message out about the book because publishers don't sell books, authors do. But I always need outside help to do that because that's not what I do well. And it's, I don't even like to do it, right? So in life, rem remember, whatever you do well that has value, there's probably aspects of what you do well that are aspects of making that go to bigger levels that are going to need the value that somebody else brings, either an outside agency or an inside person or somebody. We're not good at everything. We're just not good at everything. That's why an executive team has a company, in a company, they have a CEO, it's the big picture person, right? But then they have a chief operating officer that makes all the things work. They have a marketing person that makes all the marketing work and sales. They have a technology person. Now, sometimes you can't have that in a small business around your table, but you have to find those functions somewhere through a lot of different ways. Okay, I'm going to... Um, Mute myself here and cough. We don't have a cough button. Hold on. That wasn't that graceful, but it did the trick. Okay. Um, so let's go back to the phones. 844-940-2774 um, is the number. And we are going um, to look at... Um, who, do, where. Uh... Okay, Mandy, very common painful problem caused from Hawaii who suffered a severe <clears throat> emotional neglect from her mother, went to counseling with her mom, doesn't think her mom's grasping the concepts, reopened the neglect wound. Um, what's the right size effort for my situation? Okay, Mandy, let's talk about this. Welcome to the program. Hi. <clears throat> hey there. Can you hear me? I can. Great. Um, do you want me to kind of rephrase the question, I guess? Yeah, kind of rephrase the question. Give me a little bit about it. Can't can't do a whole history here, but just tell me yeah. what we're doing. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I don't so want to be your emotional to... mother, you know, but I, <laughs> but, but we have to Right, keep me it. either. So, yeah. um, what's um, going on? Yeah, so, so I, I moved back to where I'm from uh, for about a year and a half, and my parents were both there, and I had had, like, a pretty rocky relationship with my mom, and um, how, how old are you? I just started to notice... I'm, tw I'm 31. 31. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. And you, and um, you, so, you had a rocky relationship with her in your growing up years, and then you moved back there and lived with yeah. her for a year. Um, I only lived with her for like a couple of months, but in the same area for a year and a half. Yeah. Okay. And um, I, a lot because of, your books and I've just been in talk therapy and kind of doing my own research about relationships and boundaries and everything. So I started to kind of see like some emotional manipulation and just different things. And um, I don't remember the event that happened, but the catalyst to us going to counseling was her just kind of doing all of that and me seeing it. And I just was like, if you want a relationship with me, I need a third party here because like, I can't keep doing this. What was she um, doing? So she give, give, me, give me like one one quick example of. I can. Of I will give it to you in a nutshell. So this is. So what she does is, I I will come to her with something that she did that hurt me. She will somehow flip it back on me. Start talking about her own trauma. Start crying and then want to okay, hug give, me give, and not. Give me an example. Out. Give me an example of something she would do that hurt you. Um. Well, she. Since I can't remember that specific instance, the next most recent one was when I moved, I left a dresser there that was worth about $800. And she, uh, 
she split up with my dad and they had a big yard sale and she sold that dresser without communicating with me for a hundred dollars. She and sold then was what? Confused what, what, why. what was it she sold? She, it was a dresser. It was like an antique solid wood dresser that was worth probably about $800 minimum. Okay. And she pawned it off for a hundred for a hundred dollars <throat> without talking to me about it, and then was confused why I was upset. Okay. That All makes right. sense. That's the only. Yeah, that, um, that makes sense. That that's kind of a yeah. That's kind of an object one thing, but you said there's repeated things. Give me one that's um more more relational. Like. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, Still there? Yeah, I'm thinking. Um, so this is all I can think of right now is uh, when I'm in the rare case that she is able to focus on me and ask me something about my life. When I respond, she'll interrupt me, talk about herself and then completely lose track of the whole thing. And then I'm just left. Like you just asked me okay. something about myself and then abandon me. Like you can't. Okay. Even and then, finish and then you, the and then you tell her about this and she gets defensive. Yeah. She's like, well, I have this and my mom, this and my dad, this and. Okay. Mandy. You just talked about her. Yeah. Mandy. Question. Why would you do that again? Why would you why would you expect her? Why would you share vulnerable things with her and expect her to respond in any way other than self in a self-centered fashion? Yeah. Well, I stopped, and that's where we're at right now. Is that I don't talk to her at all, but she's wait, reaching out. Wait, 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 wait! She... No, hold on, hold on. That sounds kind of all or nothing to me. Okay. Yeah. So what I said specifically was, in your interactions with her, why would you, why would you be vulnerable? Doesn't mean you can't talk about yourself, but why would you? Why would you expect for her to respond in any other way than the way she always responds? I guess I don't. I just don't know what to do about it for myself wanting a relationship with her. Okay, but but and that's what I'm trying to will... that's what I'm trying to get to. Look, <clears throat> it's very sad that she's like that. Now, a lot of times when somebody's like that, they're not aware of it. And we point it out and they go, yeah. gosh, I'm sorry. I wouldn't want to be that way, blah, 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 blah. And you kind of like stumble through it. And then when they do it, you go, mom, you're doing it again. You know, I'd like to, for you to listen. And, and, and they're, and you're kind of going through it and they, you know, they fall again, you pick them back up and you work it out, but you've done that. And she basically goes off and gets defensive and doesn't, doesn't apparently want to face that. Right. Right. Okay, so unless there's something I'm missing here, I would not expect anything different than that. So, and then there's got then you got to go somewhere else to get that. Obviously, I mean you're 31, you know it's time to do that anyway, right? But I think this yeah. is a th this is a thing of grieving the mother you wish you had had, and two grieving the one that you want her to be now that she's so far not signing up to be and then asking the question given that what kind of relationship is possible with my mother right yeah i guess that that is currently where i'm at is what kind of a relationship is possible given everything that i have seen and experienced from okay, so <clears throat> that's a great question. So given what you have experienced, we know what's not possible. Right? Yeah. Okay, so we're not going to do that anymore. Okay. Yeah. I'm not going, I'm not going to expect for her to empathically respond with interest about me about anything in my life. She doesn't either either have that capability or the inclination, the willingness to do that. 
So then apart from that, what do you want with your mother? What kind of relationship would you like to have with her? When those things are not on the table. Can you say that again? What kind of what kind of what kind of things would you like to do and have with your mother that do not include her responding mm. well to you and your interests? Um, I don't know. Because that's kind of that's kind of what we have available, right? Yeah. I think that's something to think about. You know, I really believe um, that in the absence of, you know, just abuse and really hurtful, continual, awful things that somebody can't endure, um, I, th I think the best possible long-term generational relationships that we can have with parents and grandparents and extended family and all of that, that that I think that's a good a good goal to have. Now I don't want you to go get abused and hurt and all of that, but sometimes self centered people you can have conversations about stuff and you can you can make sure that she's safe and you make you know you can give to her and whatever it is to the degree that she's capable and that's where you draw the line without making yourself vulnerable. That's what I would want for you. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I I hear you and it makes sense. And I, I feel like in some aspects, I'm just trying to figure out what that looks like. Um, yeah. But <clears throat> I think the, the difficult part about doing that is that, like, she can tell when I pull back and then she, you know, she can Expresses tell when you hold. She can. She, she can tell. Wait a minute. She can tell when you hold back. How? Like when I pull away from her. Like if I'm not answering her text, we're not talking on the phone. You know. I didn't. No, I didn't say do that. I said you could still answer her text and talk to her. You just don't want something from her that she doesn't have to give. Yeah. So, I for mean, example, even when I'm not doing that, it's still a pretty exhausting relationship just because of like how how she is. Well, I can understand that. It's so like, then, you you know, when things are exhausting, we we limit our exposure. Right. So instead of an hour phone call, you have you have a 10 minute phone call. I, I just what I'm trying to get you to do is, number one, I want you to deal with your wish. You know, one of my favorite verses in the Bible says, hope deferred makes the heart sick. So if we're still wanting something from somebody that they cannot give to us, the more we continue to try to get that, your heart's going to get sick and wounded. I don't want that for you. Yeah. So I want to take that off the table. And I want you to look at it maybe not in an all or nothing way, which you may have to, I don't know. I don't know her and how horrible this is, but look at it in terms of what's possible with a severely self-centered mother. What kind of conversations can I have? What What's possible? That's all. Yeah. And that doesn't mean I never respond to her. That doesn't mean I don't reach out to her. I mean, you can still say, hey, mom, how's it going? Yeah. But but all of this is to say what I'm most concerned about is your own healing. And I think it's really important, like you said, to be in a place where you, where you A, get what you never had, what you still need, and B, um, you know, kind of grieve all of that that you're struggling with. I don't want you to continue to go to an empty well. Yeah. Okay, I don't know if that yeah. answers your question. Yeah, I mean, it does. And 
I think the second part of that and what's coming up for me when you're saying all of this is like, is just guilt. Like I feel guilty for not being in her life as much as she would like me to be. Like, I know that it hurts her, but I also know that like I'm getting hurt too. And I shouldn't yeah. feel obligated and, and to her. Give me, because... and, no, I, I, you feel obligated to what? Just like be in relationship with her more than I currently am. Like in my mind, this isn't forever. And so I'm conflicted. Like I see everything. I know what the situation is. But what is she wanting you to do? What is she wanting you to do that's more that you feel guilty about not doing? Um, I guess just talking with her about talking with her more, like calling her and what is more? More than what? More than nothing, which is what it is right okay, now. Okay, see, look, we're back to all or nothing. That's what I'm saying, that this wish for her to be what she's not hits a grief button in you and a disappointment and a hurt button where you move away and there's nothing. And then you feel guilty for not doing anything because you're not doing all of it because you can't do all of it because she can do none of it. Right. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. so look, I got to run, but I just want to take a second and I want to role play it with you because I want to hear what I'm dealing with. I'm going to be you and I want you to be her and you be the one okay. that's going to make me feel guilty. Okay. So, Hey mom, I was thinking about you. How you doing? Um, she would probably say something like, hey, honey, I haven't heard from you in a while. Was well, that true? Yeah. How how long? Um, like three months, six months. Oh, gosh. Okay. Um, <clears throat> all right. Stay in role here. Okay. Gosh, mom. You're right, it has been a while. How, how long has it been? Like six months. Six months. That's that's not good. Well, I'm talking to you now. Tell me tell me how you're doing. Mandy, are you are you jogging or moving furniture? I hear a lot of noise. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm getting in the car. <laughs> I'm taking somebody to the airport. <laughs> okay. Then I'm I'm going to let you go and not not try to role play this, but 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 basically what I want you to do is to sit down and with somebody really wise and kind of unpack, you know, you got to get to the grief and you got to get to kind of face in reality that she's not going to be what you want her to be. And then really realistically look at what kind of relationship is possible with her. And what I was going to do on the role play is when, you know, she says, well, you hadn't talked to you a while ago. Gosh, mom, you're right. It's been a while. How are you doing? I, I, I was missing you. Tell me how it's going. And then if she comes back with another, yeah, I know it has been a while. Um, but, you know, mom, I got a question. When um, it sounds like that six months thing has been hard for you. Why didn't you call me? You don't call me. See, she, you're playing into this. It's all on you. <laughs> and there, there's just ways to handle that with good boundaries and empathizing and saying, yeah, it has been a while. I've been, you know, I've been, I've been doing stuff. Sounds like you've been doing stuff, but let's catch up. How are you? And, and you can negotiate that. But what I'd like to see is get out of the all or nothing if it's possible. And See what goes from there. Okay. Um, let me see. Where are we? Um, we are. How do you know? I gotta stop calling this um, <laughs> an hour long show. I never can pull that off because um, 
you guys are so much fun to talk to and the issues are so good to talk about. So we probably do need to um, have a wrap for today, um, I think. Now, Albie, I'm uh, going like, uh, I'm looking at the clock here. Yeah, okay. So sorry about that. I was trying to um, understand the time. Um, we started with, and this is a good example. We started with looking at how our day-to-day -day life can heal us. Now, why was I saying what I was saying to Mandy? Well, first of all, let's say what I, let's make sure you're hearing me not say what I was not saying. I was not saying somebody that's abusive and too triggering and awful and all sorts of stuff. I mean, I have seen stuff that I tell people, just don't talk to them, right? And sometimes that has to happen. But if you're not in any real danger, then what you might want to look at is, like I said, <clears throat> what can I do that's possible? Now, when you're a child, you can't do that. As I said, when you're dependent on a mother for sourcing you emotionally and in 10,000 other ways, then you can't come with a full tank and play offense and defense when somebody's supposed to be carrying you down the field. It, it just doesn't work. But as an adult, when you're you're healing from all of that stuff and you're getting strong, these patterns are still in there. See, they get triggered of this all or nothing. Mom's not giving me what I need. And so I unplug from mom, which you probably had to do to survive. I would want to begin to use day-to-day -day life to learn how to be present and strong and deal with a difficult mother staying present and strong. That's what I mean by living out life and doing new things. Now, again, sometimes you can't do that. And please don't write me the angry emails saying, you're telling me to get abused by my whoever. I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that. I don't want you to be abused or whatever else. What I'm saying, if you get to a strong place where you're just dealing with somebody that can't be what you ideally would like for them to be, there's other levels of relationship that we can have. And I'll close with one story. I'll never forget this. It was on... 60 Minutes or 2020 or some, you know, one of those magazine shows years ago. It was talking about taking care of elderly parents. And um, and I think the point was that sometimes, you know, you can't have them live in your home. They're too, you know, need assisted living or, you know, maybe dementia setting in or whatever. But it showed the different options for this. I'll never forget, it was this guy who, his mother was in an assisted living place and it showed the cameras following me and it showed how this works every day on the way home from work, he would stop at assisted living and he just put it in his budget. Remember I said, you can limit this. You don't have to put up with this for 12 hours. He would say, I'm going to stop by and see mom on the way home for 15 minutes every night. And he goes into the assisted living thing and the camera goes in and way down the hallway, you see this mother in this wheelchair. She's just glaring at him like this. And he walks up and goes, hey, mom. She goes, where have you been? I haven't seen you. To, you know, you never come. And he was there yesterday. You only come by, you know, and she's and he's going, oh, mom, yeah, I've been working this hard. Tell me about your day. And he's just being empathic and visiting his mom. And she just never gets it. And he says, well, mom, you know, got to get home. Um got to go to dinner and got the wife and kids and um, hope you have a good night and I'll see you tomorrow. And he walks out. <laughs> That's a great example. He knew what was coming, but he wanted to have whatever he could have. Now that's an extreme example. Generally life gets talked about this and the other, but you give up what is not possible and you have the best of what you have, unless that is really bad and it's going to injure you. Okay, so there we go. Another one wrap. Thank you guys um, for being part of this tribe. I love um, love talking about life with you. Remember, go to um, boundaries.me. That's a website. Boundaries.me forward slash plus to take advantage of the holiday sale where you get the whole platform of over 100 different courses. Um, and dealing with difficult family members is on there as well. So um, we'll be here again tomorrow at uh, one o'clock central time, I think. Is that right, guys?
You got it. We got it. One o'clock central. Write this number down so you can get your question ready. 844-940-2774. We will be here then. And until then, have a good day.